I am just back from the Chester Zoo Youth Symposium. Oh my gosh, what a day it has been. It has been an absolutely inspirational, amazing weekend with so many amazing speakers. It has been absolutely brilliant and I'm so lucky to have the privilege to have been able to speak there. That was absolutely amazing. The presentation went really well. I have my Tea in the Deep Blue Sea sticker. Yes, I now have stickers. Um, which I'm really excited about. I bribe people to come to my talk with stickers. I also have my lovely Chester Zoo mug of tea, which I am thoroughly enjoying and warming up after a very long day at the zoo. I went round the Chester Zoo lanterns, absolutely brilliant, absolutely gorgeous displays of lights. I had an absolutely amazing time and it's so nice to be back at the hotel and I'm just about ready for bed, honestly. So this is my presentation video. I hope you enjoy it. It is about 25 minutes long, so it is a bit of a long video. So I hope you enjoy that. Um, if you've got any questions or anything, let me know down below. If you want to follow me on Instagram, it is Tea in the Deep Blue Sea. I will leave my link down in the description for you. I hope you've all had a fantastic weekend wherever you are and have drank lots of tea. I know I certainly have. It has definitely kept me going through the youth symposium oh yeah it feels so cool having my name on the badge and having me named as a presenter oh it has been absolutely fantastic such such a delightful weekend with so many amazing people and it was so lovely to meet everyone so if you were there this weekend it was lovely to meet you thank you for coming if you weren't hopefully i'll see you next time and i hope you enjoy this video thank you very much for watching Cheers. Yeah. You can awesome. introduce yourself, go on, I know nothing about it, so I'm excited as everyone else here is here. Fire away. Thank you very much. So I'm Victoria Emma O'Brien, I'm an independent conservationist. I know a lot of you are here with groups, I'm here building no mates by myself. So I'm delighted to be here at Chester Zoo's very first youth symposium. So I hope everyone's having a good weekend, enjoyed the nice lunch. So today I'll be focusing on ocean conservation, sharing my passion for marine life to help educate and inspire everyone here to become involved in ocean conservation and raise awareness of how important our oceans are. So I'll be covering an introduction to ocean conservation, climate change, coral bleaching, the plastic pandemic and what you can do to help. The future of the ocean is our future, it's my future, it's your future. It impacts almost every area of our lives. Without us even realising it, the ocean helps with our economic, social and ecological well-being of everyone and everywhere. We are the generation that can go on to save our oceans and save our planet's ecosystem. We need the oceans and they need us to be the change in the world. We have the privilege and more importantly, the moral obligation to do so, to ameliorate the countless years of damage caused by the human race. We live in a world unlike any other, not just the natural world, but the technological world as well, and the way they are coming together to help save our natural world. The world that we rely on for so much, that is at the very essence of our being. So what do you think of when you think of the ocean? I know for many of us, probably, myself included, it's the brilliantly coloured coral reefs that are home to thousands of species, both vertebrates and invertebrates worldwide. The beauty that is there in the vast array of species. Sadly, due to climate change, corals are becoming damaged through something called, something called coral bleaching, which I will cover later on in this presentation. This could lead to some of the most beautiful and interesting creatures becoming extinct. Whales, turtles, sharks, rays, fish, clownfish and blue tangs like Nemo and Dory could all be extinct. However, it doesn't all have to be doom and gloom. I would like to cover how you can be the ones to make changes to save our oceans. So, what is ocean conservation? Ocean conservation or marine conservation is the protection of marine species and ecosystems in the oceans and seas around the world. It's not just about protecting underwater species, populations and habitats. It's also about looking at reducing harmful human activities such as overfishing, pollution, whaling and habitat destruction. The ocean is important for all life on Earth. Ecosystems and marine species must be preserved and protected as well as being a tremendously helpful resource to us as human beings, the ocean is something that should exist, not just because it helps us, but because everything there has its own right to exist. However, I would like to briefly touch on 
why the ocean is important to us as humanity and why this means we need to save it. 50 to 80 percent of the world's oxygen is produced by phytoplankton, which are tiny microscopic marine plants. The ocean is the largest carbon sink on Earth, sequestering up to 50 times more carbon than the Earth's atmosphere. This is done with the help of kelp forests that are essentially the ocean's equivalent of trees. They absorb CO2 and nitrogen compounds, cleaning the atmosphere, while capturing up to 20 times more carbon per acre than land forests. This doesn't mean we should get forget about forests though. Land forests are very important and deforestation actually adds to climate change and damages our ocean. So one fifth of the world's animal protein comes from the ocean. Ocean ecosystems also contain ingredients used in medications, treatments, and scientific research. Numerous cancer fighting drugs have also come from things such as coral reefs, such as prostaglandin from sea fans and bryostatin from coral rhizomes. With nearly 80% of our oceans being unexplored or unmapped in 2021, there's so much we don't know about them yet, so who knows what there is still to find. Hopefully we will actually get a chance to find that if they're not destroyed. Ocean currents distribute heat across the body, which helps to keep temperatures and weather at ideal levels, as well as absorbing over 90% of the heat and around 30% of carbon dioxide emissions produced by humans. Without this heat being trapped, the average surface temperature of the Earth would be 50 degrees, which is half the a uh, half boiling temperature of water. So a world without our oceans, what a depressing world that would be. The oceans are the life support system of all living beings on Earth as we know it. Life would not exist without the oceans. The oceans are a crucial part of the planet's water cycle, which in turn drives weather and climate. Without the oceans, Earth would be a vast desert. If we lost the oceans, we would lose 97% of the Earth's water. The small amount of liquid left would not be enough to sustain the water cycle and the full drinkable water would also quickly evaporate. Within days, most people and animals would die from dehydration. In a few weeks, plants would start to decay in the dry air and forests would follow within a few months. The dead dry vegetation would eventually ignite all of these fires and cause the planet to become less oxygenated. If humans were still alive at this point, the air would be unbreathable and the temperatures would be scorching and that would wipe us out for good. So, climate change. There are three main impacts of climate change on our oceans. These are a rise in sea level, ocean acidification, and an increase in sea surface temperature, also known as ocean warming. So what are all of these things, and how do they affect us? Sea level rise. Sea level rise refers to the rapid increase in the global sea level, which is the average level of the Earth's ocean, the level of the sea surface. The sea level has been increasing at an alarming rate due to two main impacts of climate change. Thermal expansion and melting of the ice caps and glaciers. So the impacts for this for coastal communities can be devastating. The main threats arising from this include erosion, flooding, marine pollution, habitat loss and fragmentation, heavy rain and strong winds, and loss of land. According to a report by Climate Central, Huge areas of Cheshire, where we are right now, could be underwater by 2050 if the sea level continues to rise. So think of all that could be lost. Ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is where the CO2 present in the atmosphere is absorbed by seawater. Chemical reactions take place to reduce the pH of seawater, the concentration of carbonate ions, and the total amount of calcium carbonate minerals. The decrease in pH means that the ocean is more acidic, so this is harming all of the wildlife in the ocean. So there are three main human or anthropogenic causes of this. These are the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and industrial processes. So not only do the farming tools used in deforestation release CO2, but all of the carbon that was once processed and stored by the trees is then released as well. So this can lead to depletion of food sources, reduction in coastal protection through loss of corals, and billions of dollars from the tourism industry lost annually. Why would you want to go and see something if there's nothing there? So calcium carbonate, which is um, being at decreased levels, um, is what corals need to produce their skeletons. So without this, uh, it's harder for them to produce their skeletons, they are more frail. So this means less protection for us against storms and cyclones as they do act as a natural defence barrier and ocean warming. Ocean warming, caused by the presence of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, is where the ocean absorbs large amounts of heat. 
from the atmosphere, causing the water, especially the sea surface, to become warmer. This poses a threat to numerous marine organisms that are not adapted to the high temperatures. The sea surface, down to around 76 metres, absorbs most of the gases from the atmosphere. This warms at a much faster rate compared to the other areas. This is a major threat to the marine environment, with many organisms, from whales to plankton, living in this area. The majority of marine organisms aren't able to adapt to the fluctuating ocean temperatures, leading to a high probability of mortality, alteration in their distribution of breeding patterns, and an inability to develop and grow properly. The rising sea temperatures are also causing the ice caps to melt. Not only does this add to the rising sea level, but this can cause habitat fragmentation, so things such as polar bears, seals, marine birds may not be able to find refuge, hunt or reproduce. Warmer ocean temperatures also affect climate patterns, leading to stronger and more frequent storms. This is a problem for both marine life and humans, with a potential increase in human and wildlife mortality. So, coral bleaching. So you may not know this, but corals are actually an animal, they're not a plant. So they're an animal that are made of polyps. These contain millions of microscopic algae called zooxanthellae that give corals the colour. These are what also allows corals to eat they provide food for the coral. So when the temperature rises, these plants aren't able to do their jobs correctly. The coral identifies as a problem and expels them, so the coral is then no longer able to eat and will eventually die. So this is extremely stressful for the corals and this is what leads to their bleaching. So at this stage, they are not dead, however they are extremely vulnerable to diseases and mortality. So as you can see, they start off a white colour when they are bleaching, and then at the end they are dead and covered in green algae. So you go from healthy coral to dead coral covered in algae. So they are a natural defence of breakwater. As well as providing shelter for animals, coral reefs help to protect us. They act as a natural barrier against large waves as well as helping protect our coastlines. And this helps protect things like kelp forests that are really important nursery grounds for fish. So UK coral reefs, yes the UK does have coral reefs as I think it's been mentioned a few times throughout this weekend, you don't always have to go somewhere tropical and amazing to see wildlife, you can see it right here on our doorstep. Some of our coral reefs are over 8,000 years old and are home to a huge variety of marine plants and animals. So one of these reefs is located in the Canyons Marine Conservation Zone off the west coast of Cornwall, Cornish coast. And there is also numerous reefs on the west coast of Scotland. So we've all heard of the Great Barrier Reef located off the coast of Australia. A reef that is around 500,000 years old and in under 30 years we have destroyed half of it. The threat to coral reefs is growing with three global scale mass bleaching events having, ha having happened. So according to NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the third global bleaching event from 2014 to 2017 brought mass bleaching level stress to more than 75% of global reefs. Nearly 30% also suffered mortality level stress. This bleaching event was the longest, most widespread and most destructive on record. So many animals rely on the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs around the world for their home. Here are just some of the animals that rely on the Great Barrier Reef. Picture a city. All of the parts of that city work together. You have the houses for the people, the roads for the cars. Well, the coral reef is like that in the ocean. The corals form the buildings that are home to thousands of inhabitants. There is, even, there is even morning and evening traffic. You can't even escape it in the ocean. So the corals form the building for the city where they are home to around 25% of all marine species. So I'd like to talk about the symbiotic relationship between some of these animals on the coral reef. So the scalloped hammerhead shark, an absolute beautiful shark, and sharks are nothing to be afraid of. Um, so they are critically endangered according to the IUCN Red List. The loss of sharks has led to a decline in coral reefs, seagrass beds and commercial fisheries. By taking sharks out of the coral reef ecosystem, the larger the larger predatory fish will increase in abundance, so there will be less herbivores. So the macroalgae expands and the coral is no longer able to compete. And this will change the ecosystem to one of algal dominance, so this affects the survival of the reef system. Dugongs are classed as vulnerable with their global population increasing. 
and the Great Barrier Reef population is possibly one of the largest surviving populations. Dugongs play an important role in maintaining coastal ecosystems. Their constant browsing of seagrass encourages regrowth, ensuring critical habitat and feeding sites for a host of other marine species. The coral reef is a really important feeding ground for dugongs, so healthy dugongs means healthy seagrass and also healthy reefs. Hawksbill sea turtles. So Hawksbill sea turtles have a beak-like mouth, which they use to forage on a variety of marine sponges. So marine sponges are something that aggressively compete with coral for space. So by removing the sponges the reef from the reef, the hawksbills allow the corals to grow and colonise. Without hawksbills, sponges are likely to dominate the reef communities, further limiting the growth of corals and modifying the very structure of coral reef ecosystems. So, parrotfish. Before I get on to parrotfish, I've got a really interesting fact about parrotfish for you. So, you know the famous white sand beaches in Hawaii? They're actually made from parrotfish poo. Way to ruin it for us. <laughs> I know, I know, I just love sharing it. So, um, the fish, they bite and scrape algae off the rocks and dead coral with their parrot-like beaks and they grind it up. So it's the mostly the inedible calcium carbonate material and um, they excrete it as sand. So all of those beautiful sand beaches you're imagining, that's just poop. <laughs> so, next time you're at the beach, just think of that. <laughs> So parrotfish are a really important species for coral reefs. So algae can quickly dominate the reefs and stop coral larvae from settling and creating the next generation of coral reefs. So parrotfish help to keep the algae growth under control and provide space for new corals to go, to grow. So the plastic pandemic. Most of us have seen these images, the truly heartbreaking images that display the plastic pandemic that is going on around us. Some as recent as 2020, where many more disposable single-use products have been used and discarded of inappropriately, leading to a variety of wildlife being endangered. Every minute, the equivalent of a truckload of rubbish enters the ocean. Throughout this presentation, that is 20 truckloads of rubbish. So you may have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is a collection of marine rubbish floating in the Pacific Ocean that is six times larger than the UK. So a percent of this is made up of microplastics and they are a problem throughout the ocean. So does anybody know what microplastics are? Put your hands up if you know, have heard of microplastics. So most of you have heard of microplastics, so I won't go too much into detail, but yes, they are tiny fragments of plastic less than five millimetres in length. So plastic doesn't go away, it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces creating microplastics. And they are a big problem. They're ingested at multiple levels of the food chain and can build up to toxic levels in apex predator. They can even end up in the food that we eat. So when ingested, they can block the gastrointestinal tract of organisms or trick them into thinking that they have eaten and that they are full, so it leads to starvation. Our toxins can also adhere to the surface of these, so that can lead to high levels of toxins being ingested and being in high concentrations in species. So if we continue at our current rate, there is likely to be more plastic than fish in our oceans by 2050. Plastic pollution has even reached the bottom of the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest point in the ocean, and this is around seven miles deep. So, the conservation conversation, what you can do. So there are a number of ways you can help with plastic pollution. I always carry my reusable water bottle, and you can see you can, you can see on the screen some of the things that you can do. I always carry a reusable coffee cup as well, although mine's for tea, for the 50 cups of tea a drink per day. So I absolutely rely on that all of the time. You can also use things such as reusable cutlery and things like that to reduce single-use plastics. So another important thing is the five R's. Refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot. Refuse, learn to say no to things you don't need. Reduce, donate or sell things you no longer need. Reuse, switch to reusable items like cotton buds, tissues and reusable makeup remover pads. Recycle, sort your waste correctly and minimise what goes to the landfill. Rock, compost your own household waste or take part in the community programme for composting organic waste. So there are numerous ways that you can help. Don't charge your electrical devices overnight. Wash your clothes at a cooler temperature. Only eat sustainably caught fish. A really good tool for this is the Good Fish Guide. 
turn your heating down, even if it is just by one degree, it all makes that difference, or just put a jumper on. You can also sign petitions, write to your local MP and volunteer. One of the most important ways you can help is by starting a conversation with your friends and family. People are more likely to become involved in conservation when they know others are doing that action too. Share with your friends and family what you are doing and what they can do. Help to educate and inspire others to do some of these actions. If everyone does a small amount, it will make a difference. With Christmas coming up, you can even buy eco-friendly gifts or put together little eco-friendly gift hampers for people. So if everyone takes small actions, it can make a big difference. Remember, small actions have big consequences. Thank you. Are there any questions? Well, I've always loved the ocean. I've absolutely, since I was a child, loved the ocean, loved the beach, always had a passion for animals, and knowing what is going on in the world, I wanted to do something about it and <coughs> save it really, so marine conservation, and knowing how much I love the ocean, how important a thing is for me, I want to be able to save that for future generations. Do I have anyone else who a question? Go on, John. Um, yeah, I guess I've got like two two parts is the first one is you know we know how big a role the ocean plays in you know, the, the planetary system but why do you think it's always sort of forgotten about and is treated as like an aftermath you know we prioritize tropical rainforests over mm. health forests and then my second part is you know hopefully 2022 we'll see the signing of like the high seas treaty to protect you know the areas beyond biodiversity uh, beyond natural jurisdiction but mm. how do we stop them from just becoming like paper parks you know like our current mpas only 5% of the UK's MPAs have bottom crawler bans, so how do we stop them from becoming that? How do we combat politicians who want, want to you know, do a crap job, do a useless right. job? So, yes, politicians yeah, big are. question. <laughs> yes, so Anyone that's good. a reminder. Yeah. What, right, so I think the oceans get forgotten about a lot. It's out of sight, out of mind. We're on land, we're not living out on the ocean. We are on land. It's what it's what we see every day, it's the oceans, that they're, they're out of the way, they're something that people don't really think about, they're something that are, that are forgotten about, and I think there's been a lot of big campaigns about saving our rainforests and everything like that, and there hasn't been as many that I'm aware of big ocean campaigns that you see all over the news, that you see anywhere, I think there's a lack of publicity, and yeah. So what was your second part of your question? Um, how do we sort of talk to politicians and policy makers about actually making MPAs like protected so that they're not just paper parks? I'm not entirely sure, honestly. Um, I think that's a really tricky one. I'm probably not the best person to ask on that one. I don't know, unfortunately. Um, but I'll have a think, and if I think of anything, yeah. I will let you know. Has anyone got an easy question and Joe taking no prisoners today? <laughs> Go on. You said you're here independently, but do you work in marine conservation? No, I don't work in marine conservation at the moment. I'm hoping to study marine biology at university. Um, so it's just a bit of a passion project for me at the moment. I run a YouTube channel that I have recently started called Tea in the Deep Blue Sea, where I drink tea and talk about the ocean and also sea monkeys. Uh, which I'm filming for today, so hello to YouTube. Um, so yeah, I don't work in it at the moment, although that's the dream really, is to work in marine conservation. Brilliant. Is that anywhere else? Any more questions? No? Ah, great. <laughs> So that was my presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it and learnt something. If you've learnt anything new, give this video a thumbs up. If you've got any questions or anything, let me know down in the comments below. I would absolutely love to hear from you. I'm just warming up with a nice cup of tea in my new Chester Zoo mug. Oh yeah, they're so pretty. They have so many amazing animals. I'm looking forward to going around there tomorrow and having a proper look at them all. So thank you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Bye-bye for now. Cheers.